This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. The world has been mourning the passing of Steve Jobs, the co-founder, chairman and chief executive of Apple. He created many of the products that we know and use today, from the simple Apple computer to the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. But he's really unusual as a high-tech entrepreneur in that he succeeded. Many people who come up with innovative high-tech ideas fall by the wayside. Martin Blimor from the Australian School of Business has been studying the process by which high-tech entrepreneurs get their innovations off the ground. So Martin, first of all, just concentrating on Steve Jobs initially, what can we learn from Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs uh, had the, I guess, the fortune of meeting Steve Wozniak, but also had the creative insight to say, this technology that Wozniak is building is, is good for the audience that he's targeting, a lot of the technologists who actually could possibly assemble it themselves. But he also knew the business side of things to say, if this has value to one audience, perhaps it has value to another audience. Can we package it and commercialize it in a way that appeals to a larger audience and to the masses eventually? Uh, and he obviously had a lot of conviction as well. After all, he dropped out of college after just one term. That's right. Uh, a lot of times once these ideas catches, catch, the entrepreneurs do end up transitioning from whatever their previous occupations were over to a full-time management of the business itself. It's a bit of a myth that entrepreneurs start right off the ground. Sometimes they have full-time jobs and then do entrepreneurship on top of that as a side project. And then if that project works, then, then they'll switch completely. And so when he started going around pre-selling Wozniak's product, that generated interest, it generated sales, it generated revenues so that he could build Apple without taking any equity, at least from the start. But at the same point, he keeps on saying that he wasn't afraid of failure. And in fact, he, he must have had a lot of convictions to drop out of college and carry on selling these computers. That's true. Uh, a lot of times, failure is uh, a relative thing, shall we say. Uh, a lot of the, the more creative entrepreneurs will find a way to take risks, but contain them in some sort of way. They'll, they'll run experiments like we do in a laboratory environment and say, okay, I'm going to run this experiment for two months. If it doesn't work out, here's a criteria by which I'll cancel it and then shift gears to, to another project. Uh, and some of them will take bigger risks than others. But although he was a risk taker, he wasn't entirely suited to the corporate environment. After all, he ended up leaving the company for an extended period before coming back. Is that also a common thing amongst entrepreneurs? There is a myth that entrepreneurs and managers take different risks. And the, the reality is that they take roughly the same risk, but what drives an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur is not the risk-taking side of things, but it's the, the, the quest to, I guess, be their own boss and to make decisions based on what they'd like to do. But even that's a bit of a myth because they're still at the mercy of the customer uh, and at who will be able to pay their rents and pay their groceries and support their families. So there's a, a considerable more flexibility for, for an entrepreneur to go out and, and pursue their own goal but they're just catering to a much more diverse group of stakeholders. Instead of fitting within a hierarchical environment or into a, a structure gram from a corporate environment, now they've got stakeholders who are their shareholders, their investors, um, consultants, employees, the family members of the employees, customers, suppliers, and it gets much more diversified. Uh, and when we actually look at the products, the eye in the iPhone, people often said it just stood for being an interactive phone, but Steve Jobs had a different idea, didn't he? Uh, I actually did a quick search on where the eye came up with it. It sounds like it came out of nowhere. Some people attribute the eye to internet, um, but the genius of that, of the eye and the branding, is that the eye means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It could be identity, ideas, innovation. Arguably, I would say it stands best for iteration and integration. The iPhone brought together a whole lot of different aspects. Your phone isn't just a phone. It's your mobile browser. It's a GPS device. It's your address book. It integrates a whole lot of different ideas. But to get that right, there were a lot of competing products out there at the same time in the market. To get that right, he probably had to go through a lot of iterations. So if you think of, say, the dimension of the iPad, where it is smaller than a regular A4 sheet, how did it get to be that size? There, there were other iterations that were bigger, that were smaller, so there was some internal testing that most of the public was not privy to. Apple iterated and iterated and iterated until they got the product right. And at the center of innovation and entrepreneurship, you must see a lot of people who come along to you where you must want to say to them, go through more iterations, get the product right. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Their uh, case in point, um, Pandora, the online music service, went through about 300 pitches until they finally found somebody who, who followed their idea, who who bought into what they were what they were pitching. Some entrepreneurs will will pitch and adapt much sooner than the guys from Pandora did. Some entrepreneurs will adapt right away, and other ones will stubbornly say, "No, this is the idea. This is believe it or not, join me or not is up to you." But this is the idea, and they're they're a little less flexible, but. The better ideas that we see out there take a lot of different advice and feedback on board. It's not at, uncommon at all for entrepreneurs to pitch their ideas a hundred times. And in fact, is there a common reason for failure amongst entrepreneurs with those developing high-tech ideas? And you must see some that you, you just know are not going to work in their original form. Definitely. That's quite often when they've uh, overcommitted themselves to the technology, uh, developed it too far to a point that uh, it's now too costly or too complex for anyone to understand other than them. And they might have been better off doing something much simpler. Uh, I think Instagram, for example, created a, a much more complex system, uh, and they realized through their, the platform that they were building, people were just interested in sharing photos. So that's the platform they built. That's actually also the way Flickr developed. They started with an online gaming company and realized people inside the online game were using it as a chatting platform to share photos. So they said, let's leave everything else aside. Let's strip out the complexity of this entire product, concept, business, and just focus on one thing. Just focus, 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 get that done, get it right, and get it out there. But once you've got the right product, how do entrepreneurs then actually get it to market, to get the cash together, to get the marketing together, and get the product on the shelves? That's, that's a very, very social process. Uh, there aren't well-known directories of, here, here are the, the investors that you should talk to. There might be directories, say the Australian Venture Capital Association has a list of known venture capitalists, but it doesn't tell you the idiosyncrasies of each of those venture capitalists, who else they've invested in, how much capital they have at hand, what their, what their preferences are. You, you have to find that out in a person-to-person -person way. It does seem as if there ought to be a more organized system for doing this. Surely the government should be stepping in. They can. Uh, there's a, another question as to whether they should as well. Uh, currently, the government's qu quite good at supporting other ecosystems that support the support the entrepreneurs. So, for example, Fishburn is a local co-working co-location facility for entrepreneurs. Just received some government funding. So, the government funds the people who organize the network for the entrepreneurs. They don't directly pick and choose which entrepreneurs should succeed or should not succeed. In other cases, such as the Australian Technology Showcase, the government does get directly involved with the entrepreneur and does help pick and choose which of them should be sent overseas to help facilitate relationships with their customers or suppliers overseas. So what else can the government do? The government could lean on the superannuation funds to set aside a little more capital for the venture capital industry. For example, in other countries, such as the US or, or in Europe to some extent, Superannuation funds try and differentiate themselves by having a component that goes into high-risk capital. Now, that's a way for them to, to possibly get more returns, but also lose some of that money. So if my superannuation fund loses 5 or 10% of that money, it barely makes a dent in the funds that I have with the superannuation fund. But if they make huge returns, then I'm more likely to put more money into that superannuation fund versus another one. So, for example, if the superannuation funds in Australia set aside 1%, and put that into the venture capital industry. That would 30-fold the current venture capital industry. The, another example is that Excel Partners in the US over the last year has put as much venture capital into Australian startups as the entire venture capital industry together. That shows that there's, there's potential here, so much so that foreign, companies are inve foreign venture companies are investing in Australia, but perhaps the local funding industry is not quite where it could be. Uh, is, is this because maybe in Australia we're not actually generating enough high-tech inventions or enough innovators? There is certainly a rise in supply of high-tech innovators. Um, some of the investors will push back and say, well, wait a sec, I have money, I don't see the innovators happening. So there's a bit of a need to create a market for innovators and investors to meet each other. So there, there are more and more forums starting up like that, such as Sydney Angels and the Innovation Bay but also TIE Sydney, the Indus Entrepreneurs Sydney. Uh, they're getting much more active this year. They just had a pitch competition two days ago for which three UNSW students won prizes too. And finally, back to what we can learn from Steve Jobs. Could Steve Jobs actually have succeeded in an Australian environment? That's a question that could easily be up for debate. It's on November 2nd at the Meet the Entrepreneur event that we're having downtown that starts arguing what is the role that 
the government, industry, and the entrepreneur should have in fostering more Australian innovation. Uh, so we're bringing together some very successful panelists from government, from industry, from the venture capital industry to discuss how do we get more companies like Atlassian? How do we get more of these big success stories here in Australia? And does geography matter? Martin, I'm sure the world will continue mourning Steve Jobs, but at the same point, his products will live with us probably for a long time to come. Martin, thank you very much. My pleasure, Julian. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.